Strange things are afoot at the Circle K. That kid is back on the escalator again! Ain't gonna hurt. Is my boomstick! Oh! Game over, man! Game over! Welcome to the Barkin' Bin. He is your host, Ben Mason. And he is your co-host, Sandra Luketic. And today we're talking 1990s, I Come in Peace. We assume if you're listening to this episode, you have already seen the movie. And some of you might have seen it as Dark Angel, but not me. It's I Come in Peace. That's how I'm going to refer to it throughout the episode. Yeah. Um. What's with the name discrepancy? Uh, it was originally called Dark Angel, but then it, it became an issue because there were already two or three previous films called The Dark Angel or something similar. So they uh, they just changed it up. I mean, it it's still released as Dark Angel in some territories. Uh, but for me, as a kid, it was I Come in Peace. Well, when I looked it up to watch on Tubi, um, I looked up I Come in Peace and nothing came up. And yep. then I searched Dark Angel and that's how I was able to watch the movie. So... Yeah, uh, even with the uh, the Blu-ray re-release that um, Shout Factory put out, uh, it is called Dark Angel. So they, they've reclaimed the original title, but okay. yeah, clear up that confusion. Um, All right, then. First, um, first impression, like first time seeing the movie, were you aware of it at all? No, no, no. Okay. Sorry. I kind of thought this would be like a corner store rental for you, but... Um, um, I mean, I guess they just didn't stock it at my corner store. Which is crazy because Dolph Lundgren movies seem to be everywhere. Any any action movies, and like, honestly, they should be because yeah. Dolph is awesome, fantastic. Uh, I have to ask you if you notice the director's name. Oh, come on, man! <laughs> he only did four movies, and we covered two of them already. What? Yeah. Hmm. What would the other movie four be? like? feature films. He did a lot of TV movies and TV shows. Uh, did he do Stone Cold? Yes. Oh! <laughs> I, I didn't know that. Very similar. Uh, yeah, I was just trying to think of another um, like, I don't want to say low budget, but like, not mainstream action movie that we covered. You're on the right track. What, am I supposed to guess the other ones? Yeah, there's only one more that we've covered. Oh, I thought you meant this was the second. No, this is the third. Oh, okay. Um, it's one of your favorites. It's one of my favorites. It's not Kung Fu Dad. No, it's um, not Kung Fu Dad. Uh, I got nothing here, man. In the movie, the lead jumped over a speeding car. Action Jackson? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> We're talking pedigree here. I'll Craig, tell you one thing. Jackson. I'll tell you one thing. He ain't top in Action Jackson. No, you can't. It, it, that the, movie it, it, was possible. just so good. <laughs> but I, I, I love the fact that this movie is directed by Baxley, who did Action Jackson, Stone Cold. Right off the bat, if I hadn't seen the movie, but I knew he directed it, I knew I was most likely going to enjoy it. But you look at the writing team that did it. Jonathan Tider, don't really know. David Kep, however, I don't think you know that name. Oh, come on, no, I don't. <laughs> is one of the most successful screenwriters in the business. So, I'll just give you a few. And by a few, I mean a fair amount. Oh, Toy Soldiers, which I love and you have never seen. You don't know that. Have you seen it? No. There you go. <laughs> Death Becomes Her. Uh, see one that of my one. Favorites. Jurassic Park. I know you've never heard of that movie. Uh, Carlito's Way, The Shadow, Mission Impossible, The Trigger Effect, which we are 100% going to cover at some point because not enough people have heard about that movie. Uh, the Lost World, Stir of Echoes, which I love, based off of the Richard Matheson story and starring Kevin Bacon. Um, the Sam Raimi Spider-Man film. Oh, we Se cover that one. Yeah. Secret Window, which makes sense. Uh, War of the Worlds, the Tom Cruise version. Sadly, Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. Jesus Christ, that's a massive spider on my wall. Anyway, uh, <laughs> Angels and Demons. <laughs> and uh, oh, he's coming right at me now. Uh, the Mummy, 
the Tom Cruise one, which I'm pretty sure I'm the only person in the world that enjoyed it. I haven't the seen dude, it, so dude's Can't been see. around. He's written some amazing films. There's there is a full gamut of different genres and qualities there. Yeah, but dude, he he knows what he's doing. But yeah, do we? Oh, I was gonna get right into it, but we have to play your fucking game, don't we? I mean, we don't have to. I well, I I only thought about it at the end of the movie, so okay. I, I can. I can only think of two actors in this that we've covered in other stuff. Okay. Are there more than two? <sighs> okay. Big ones. Big ones? Yes. Fuck. Okay. Well, I'll just go right, right off the bat. We have Dolph. Yeah, obviously. Obviously. Do you need me to list the movies? I mean, you can try. All right. Uh, so <laughs> this uh, <laughs> showdown in Little Tokyo... Uh-huh. Uh, Rocky IV. Yeah. Universal Soldier. Yeah. Masters of the Universe. Yeah. Is there more? One. Um, One more, huh? Mm-hmm. We didn't do The Punisher, I don't think. Um, I'm Oh, shit. I'm drawing a blank, man. He played a character named Street Preacher. Oh, yeah. Johnny Mnemonic. There you go. Yeah, minor role. At least that's the one I forgot. I assumed it was going to be, because it, that's not really a Dolph movie. It's just a movie that has Dolph in it. And it should have more Dolph in it. That character's awesome. Yes, I agree. Um, the only other one I can think of isn't a major character, but he's in everything we seem to talk about, and that's Al Leong. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and right now, I'm going to say, every time we see Al Leong in a movie and we play this game... I'm going to play the Al Leon card, which means I don't have to say anything we've covered him in because it's impossible. Oh, good. Then I don't have to write down all of these names. <laughs> how many How many movies have we covered him in so far? Last Action Hero, Showdown in Little Tokyo, The Perfect Weapon, Bill and Ted, They Live, Action Jackson. Oh, it's only six. Mm-hmm. Oh, I thought it would be more like 10 or 12. I didn't count... Um... The perfect weapon, because that was that uncredited in the bar scene. Yeah. But, I mean, it's still accumulating, so, yeah. But, oh, man. Al Leong in this movie is great. This, I think this is the most we see of him do anything outside of Genghis Khan. Mm-hmm. Like, he feels like a legit character who's not given like a major role or anything here. He just stands out, and he's incredibly realistic in this fucked up, unrealistic film. He's very underutilized in a lot of movies. In every movie, man. I mean, Bill and Ted is exempt from that. But almost yeah. every movie, man. <laughs> uh, all right. Do you give up then? Yeah. Who else? Uh, Jim Haney. Um, Captain Malone was in Action Jackson as Morty Morton. Uh, Michael okay. J. Pollard, uh, yeah. who played oh, Boner. Yeah, Tango and Cash. Was Owen. Yeah. Uh, Alex Morris, who was Detective Ray Turner, was one of the cops at the beginning of the chase in the convenience store. He's really good. really. And really good. Kevin Page, who was just white boy number one, was uh, a mobster number two in Stone Cold. Yeah, I wouldn't have up. expected you to get that one, because that no. one was just... Well, it looks like Baxley's using uh, the same actors throughout the other movies. I mean, like you mentioned Action Jackson and Stone Cold for these actors. So it's, it's good working relationship. Positive. All right. That's that. All right. Jump right in. Yep. How did it get over there already? Forget about the Spider-Man. Uh, forget about the what? You said spider, right? Spider-Man. Oh, yeah. Cause I said, it around man, on you. I see. I see. Yeah. You're very funny. Very yeah. funny, man. Uh, funny man. Uh, Knight. A man distracted by his car's malfunctioning CD player almost hits a bus and spins into a Christmas tree lot. Exiting just before a UFO crashes into his car and we get the reveal of Talek, played by Matthias Hughes. Um, first impressions of Talek. Uh, well, before I get into Talek, I just want to say this guy driving the car... If my CD player malfunctions in a way that it spits the CD out in a projectile manner, mm. I'm not putting it back in. It's foreshadowing. 
I get it. Yeah. But it would have still been foreshadowing to do it one time. Like, I'm not getting in front of this thing. Anyway. Yeah. Well, no, also, if you're going to use this kind of setup to uh, introduce your your antagonist and, and he kills this character, make the character sympathetic. This guy's a complete asshole. And I don't care that he dies. I uh, guess he's not supposed to be the focal point here. It's just to introduce Talik, but I get it. Um, as for Talik, I'm sorry. This is like the laziest attempt at an alien look ever. Oh, you're crazy. Okay, all right. I've ex- There's lazier, but the statement stands. It's just guys with like white hair and white contacts. Like, come on. Well, only uh, only Talik has white hair. It's the the contacts. I think they're your focal point. Pun intended. Um, oh, I thought the other one had white hair too. Nope. Just oh, a clear. I don't know what hair. I'm talking about then. <laughs> I think he's incredibly imposing. Dude, dude's fucking massive and terrifying to me. Yeah, but, just the look takes it away from me. What do you think about the voice? <laughs> I find it problematic. Um. So I didn't know if I should bring this up now or later, but why does he keep saying I come in peace? I don't know. And why I can he only it. say the one thing where the guy chasing him can communicate? I don't know how they speak English. I don't know why they're so humanoid. But it makes sense when you think about like the, the reason he's there. It's- Even still, I would say that at the very least, if you're going to have this guy with the CD being a jerk or whatever, or the introduction to Talik... Have the first person he comes across say something like, I come in peace. And then, oh, he just picked it up from there and keeps repeating it because he's just mimicking it since he doesn't know the language. Otherwise, it's just a line that gets repeated throughout the entire movie with no purpose. Yeah, and it's the way he says it, too. Where you're like, I I don't believe you. No. (laughs) It's like a... A guttural whisper. I'm like, that doesn't sound peaceful whatsoever. It's like, it's like saying no offense and then offending someone. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry you feel that way. Yeah. Inauthentic. Um, but we cut to the credit sequence. And what do you think about this scene? It's a great way of getting, in my opinion, it's a great way of getting the uh, getting us through all the list of names while progressing the story pretty quickly. Just people breaking into the federal evidence room. I really like this. It's a weird heist scene that works very well. It's You want to say weird, sure. It's weird in the context of what the rest of the movie is, but it's a heist scene that I think is done very well and is part of the reason why this movie disappoints me. Yeah, it, it, it is a very strong start. Um one complaint I would have, though, is one of the people breaking in, um, masquerading as a police officer, using the phone to ask for Sergeant Hawkins to go to the evidence room. Because this is just to get a name tag. Mm-hmm. Am I, I'm right in that, yeah? Well, I mean, do you want to pick the issues with this scene out? Because it it pays off. It does. I never understood scenes like this in movies where somehow nobody ever recognizes these cops as people they don't recognize. Yeah, I'm right there with you. You're telling me that nobody knows this Sergeant Hawkins that they would be like, wait a minute, you're not Hawkins. And that's exactly what happens. And it's a great catch by the guy running the evidence room desk. But yeah, he just, he's fine with officers walking by that he doesn't recognize. Maybe because it's not a, a a police building, it's a federal building. So there's a lot of FBI around and all this nonsense. But he sees the Sergeant Hawkins name tag and is like, well, I know Hawkins. You're not Hawkins. I'm just going to make a bit of a phone call. But even that, that I think is brilliant. It doesn't matter. Because no. as these guys leave the building, they drop a briefcase with a bomb in it, which goes off when they leave and everyone dies. We assume. But uh, we're not even supposed to know who these guys are. And it, it seems like what, what, after we get the introduction, it seems like they're much more capable in something like this than they should be. 
because they just seem to be suits with guns later in the movie. This entire movie from here on out, and I'll say it right now, makes me wish that this was not an alien movie. It, it's a very strong action start, for sure. I, I uh, just want to see the rest of this movie. Like, this give me <laughs> Dolph versus these white boys. Yeah. It doesn't give me hope that you're going to enjoy the rest of the film. And that's sad. But we get to meet our hero next. Detective Jack Kane, played by motherfucking Dolph Lundgren. Great name. Yeah, Jack Kane, for sure. Yeah. So Just Jack- eating his sandwich on his <laughs> stakeout. Yeah. Listening to the like weird sting op. Yeah, sting, not stakeout. My apologies. Um the operation is Detective Ray Turner, you mentioned Alex Morris, is undercover trying to finalize a large drug deal with the gang called the White Boys, who stole heroin, bags and bags of heroin from the federal evidence room that we just covered. <laughs> it's no way that's traceable. Nope. Problem here. All right. You know how in like these stupid uh, drug deal scenes in action movies, it's like cocaine and like I will like poke a bag with a knife and then do like a quick bump. He's like, yeah. No, they just normally sit, sniff the bag, right? Yeah, he just picks up this bag of heroin, puts it against his face and sniffs it. And that's good enough. You'd be like, well, I don't know how else you're going to really test heroin and still be functional. Yeah. But smelling the plastic bag looks really dumb. I don't see what the problem is. You got, you got to figure out what it is. Um, we get the uh, the leader of the White Boys, uh, Sherman Howard, playing Victor Manning, and I really like this villain. I don't know what it is. Maybe he's just playing it so well that I detest him. But it seems like this character really fits in this world. Yeah, I'd like him to be the villain throughout the movie. <laughs> gotcha. No aliens. Check. Well, it's just, it's not necessary. You could replace this alien with a similar human. I mean, similar in the sense that, yeah, maybe they're injecting people to experiment on them. It doesn't need the alien element. And then just yeah. have this guy being the one behind the scenes pulling the ropes. You got you got a killed partner as motivation. Like, this is a it's fantastic very, setup for a movie that's not the movie we got. Very good setup. Even the writing here is very late 80s, early 90s action film that makes you invested in what's happening. You know it's it's popcorn trash, but it's entertaining and it draws you in. Like, just Manning and and uh, and Turner going back and forth, like, tell me again what university did you attend? <laughs> <laughs> the University of Suck My Dick. Yes, that was very inappropriate. I mean, this yeah, is a man you're trying to do worked. business with. It worked so well for the scene because you know this is not realistic. It's just fun. And you, it sets up expectations that I feel were met. But obviously, we feel very differently about this film. Well, you might be surprised. So Jack waits for his time to intervene, but is distracted by a robbery at the convenience store next door. Of course. Movie timing. Yeah. He takes out the two robbers, but in doing so, misses hearing that the white boys know Turner's a cop, and they just murder him. I'm curious about your thoughts on this. What do you mean? Do you feel like this is necessary? Do you feel like you needed that robbery, or I think it would have been better had Jack actually fucked up and just was too slow in getting in in time? Well, that's the thing. I'm... I'm watching the movie and I'm just thinking, even if he was in his car, you know, attentive to what was going on, very easily couldn't or could have failed to get there in time anyway. Because yeah. it's not like he doesn't get in there. He gets in there in time to have a little bit of a shootout with the alien after, but it's not necessary. I guess yeah. maybe yeah. it's just to, to give it a little bit of an opening and that Jack is absent because he's too good of a guy doing his job or something like that, right? Like, just to... I don't yeah, know. but he he's presented to us in, in discussions with um, his superior, uh, Malone, I think, um, that, that he he's a fuck-up. And he'll just disappear. So him actually messing up here gives him a better character arc to come out on top at the end. 
Because here yeah. we already see he's capable. We know he's capable. He's fucking Dolph Lundgren. Oh, man. When he first comes into that break-in room and spin kicks that guy, wonderful. Loved it. Yeah. Do you know why that's wonderful? Because the Cause actor it... missed his mark and Dolph knocked him out. <laughs> <laughs> well. So, yeah, he took a full-on Lundgren boot to the face. Oh, well, I mean, eh, it looks really realistic. Yes, it, it worked very well. But yeah, after the white boys kill um, Ray, Tylek shows up and murders all of them with his magic flying CD. So this is a very memorable scene for me, but what, what is your take on this weapon? Um, It's a CD that bounces off of walls and... Kills people. It's Either unique, side. I guess. Yeah. It, it's it's pretty weak, right? Yeah. And it's prominent. It's very prominent in this movie, and I, I feel like that does kind of weaken the film as a whole. But can you imagine that being one of these uh, white boys? You murder a detective, then an alien just shows up out of nowhere with a murder disc and steals your heroin? No, yeah, well, they're bad guys. You're not supposed they're to feel bad. for them. Right? That's that they got their comeuppance. Yeah. So Jack just catches on to what's going on next door and uh, rushes in to rescue Ray, but it, he's dead. We know this. So we immediately cut to the police investigating the scene. Now, there is one thing here that really stood out to me, and I'm wondering if you caught it too. Is it the guy dusting the door in the background? It's the guy dusting the door in the background. <laughs> You know, I saw that, and I'm like, Ben is totally going to mention that. I was laughing my ass. This guy fucking hates his life. <laughs> and I don't mean the character. I'm pretty sure the actor is like, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm just going to stare at this door frame. I'm going to dust the same spot over and over again, and hopefully they keep me in the movie. You said it the other day. You pay attention for people like this in the background, and I saw that guy, and I'm like, I know why. Oh, yeah. He, he, he's got the little brush. He's like, up, down, up, down. Don't look at the camera. Don't look at the oh, camera. Oh, he absolutely down. has a stance of don't look at the camera. <laughs> it's so good. This is one of my favorite parts. <laughs> 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 that fuck. Uh, so we get Captain Malone, who makes no sense to me. He just flies off the handle at Jack. Um. Yeah. Like The whole, the whole thing's nuts. My entire thought here is, what is his problem? He starts off with condolences and then just starts screaming at him. Yeah, I'm really sorry about your partner, but if I could, I'd throw you through this window. <laughs> yeah. Why? You Ray disappeared for eight days. Seven days, I can understand, but eight? <laughs> what? <laughs> also, he's like, you have to account for the stolen heroin and the money. Like, I get the money, like the 500000 He's not responsible for what went down in the evidence room earlier in the film, though. That's that's your problem. Yeah, this, um, very perplexing. <laughs> yeah, because the FBI arrives, and even Malone's like, this is your problem, to the FBI. Like, you just accused, as you said, it's Jack's problem he has to deal with. Yeah, it's all your fault. Now go on vacation. I and, guess I don't have to deal with it. I'm and go nobody, on vacation. Nobody's talking about the robbery next door. That that's gone for the rest of the movie. It's not like Ray's dead because of you. Yeah, but I was saving other people. That doesn't matter. Nope. And also, you vanished for eight days, so I'm forcing you to take eight weeks of vacation owed. That's not a threat, man. This eight days perplexes me as well, because it they never like they bring it up multiple times with both captain and with uh diane yeah where was he during these eight days they You'd never think addressed that be important yeah and i'm sure there's some theory out there that we've never heard of but it's so weird to keep bringing that up and be like what where the fuck what, what is he doing for eight days he's so glued to his job he can't not think about it but he was gone for eight days anyway yeah i got I nothing man yeah, me neither. I feel like we're missing something major here, or it's just a massive plot hole. Yeah. FBI Inspector Switzer questions Jack in the bathroom. Well, they needed a, a private place to talk. 
And evidently, that is the only private place to talk. It's That's fine. I, I can go with that. It's the other cop at the urinal. Doesn't even get to go wash his hands. Just get out of here, man. It's a crime scene. <laughs> <laughs> He's not wearing gloves. He's touching everything. Dude's pisses everywhere. I mean, what are we doing? These cops are terrible. And this questioning is absolutely insane. Like, how, how were three well-armed men killed without getting a shot off? Proper answer would be, I don't know. I wasn't there. Yeah. Well, do you think the weapon is key? P- probably. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I'm guessing I- if, if they were murdered with something weird, that's probably key to the murder. Yeah. I feel like the murder weapon will always be a factor <laughs> in a murder case. Well, where do I find Manning? I don't, I don't know. know. <laughs> I don't, he's the leader of a massive drug ring called the White Boys. You're an FBI agent. I'm a local cop. I don't know. You do this. This is your job. When he killed my partner, if I knew where he was, I probably would have <laughs> gone there. <laughs> and Dolph is so smug this entire time. Oh, he- yeah. I love it because the guy's like, my job is to know things. And then Dolph is like, well, I was just put on vacation. Or did you not know that? And the look, the look he gives him is fantastic. So Switzer just demands that Malone puts Jack back on the case. Why? I don't know. I don't know. I'm okay with not knowing, but I I can't explain it. And the next day, Jack meets his new partner, Special Agent Arwood Larry Smith. We don't know Arwood's name until the end, but whatever. But he's played by Brian Benben, who I mainly know as a comedic actor from Dream On. But uh, you have to admit, this is a a classic pairing of characters. The rebellious guy meets the the by-the-books guy. This guy is just such a smug asshole. Oh, you probably don't like me right away because I make twice as much as you and I'm more successful. Shut up. I mean, it's reasonable. You know, if I don't care who I am, if I meet Dolph or a guy of Dolph's stature, that's not the first thing I'm saying to him. I would not take a threatening stance whatsoever. No. No. <laughs> but we get a, a full intro to Coroner Diane, um, who just so happens to be Jack's ex. Now, I don't really know Betsy Brantley, but I recognized the name. So I looked into her career and it turns out she was the performance model for jessica rabbit huh which is very strange i didn't realize they needed a performance model but i guess that that would make sense anyway she has no idea what weapon was used to kill the white boys because it was so sharp and thin that it was finer than a scalpel and i mean she's just a coroner right because she doesn't totally know everything about science in this movie Exactly. (laughs) Which does come to light later, too. Uh, Another UFO crash landing reveals the arrival of alien Azik. Uh, Right away, I don't like Azik. It's the hairline, isn't it? It, I think it is. I I feel bad that's that's it, but like he... I just don't like the character. He doesn't fucking do anything anyway. No. This character is utterly pointless. He's there to die. He's there for one short scene of dialogue with Dolph later in the movie to explain what Talek is there for. And that's it. That's it. That's it. So I guess we can be thankful he's not in the movie more, but he's still in it enough to irritate me. So we cut to our leads checking out the crime scene again. And all this is just for Jack to say that when he's stuck, he follows his instincts. I hate it. So we cut to a bail bonds office where Talek kills the bondsman in the most peculiar of ways. This bondsman has just got an itchy trigger finger. <laughs> this shits the window out with a shotgun. <laughs> Damn robbers. <laughs> so if I, you thought you were just getting stuck up, <laughs> you would have flat out murdered them. <laughs> it's a high stress job, Sandro. Um, I, you are on edge when you're trying to feed your dog. Do you, 
<laughs> Do you care to uh, try and describe how Talik dispatches the bondsman? Uh, so he has like his tentacle syringe that he injects them with heroin to have cause them to have like an, an overdose so that he can then shove like a blade like syringe, I guess, into their forehead and suck out the endorphins. Nailed it. It's mm-hmm. it's ridiculous, but I like it. I assume you do not. That's fine. It's yeah. good enough motivation for the alien villain, and I guess it, it's it's creative. I'll say that, and I I enjoy that. I love the. Whole, I don't. I don't think Talek knows what he's saying because no. he says I come in peace as he's killing the guy. Yeah. It seems like a weird pop culture reference that Talek got on whatever planet he's from. It'd be like, Earth, this is what people from Earth expect us to say. Can't you see that what I was saying, though? If he had just heard that from, like, the first human he saw, it'd be like, oh, he's just mimicking the language. This is what he heard. Yeah. So we go from this really weird space murder, whatever the fuck it is, technology... Just breasts. Classic 90s action movie strip club. And here we meet the exact type of person I would expect to find in a place like this. Michael J. Pollard's boner. Oh, okay. I thought you were talking about Special Agent Smith's personality, who's apparently never seen a boob before in his life. Let alone two. Mm Mm-hmm. Are they coming pairs? (laughs) (laughs) Fuck. It's so dumb. I um, I will acknowledge that Michael J. Pollard is an icon in lower budget action and horror films. Gonna bash I, on him again like you did with Tango and Cash? I fucking hate this tiny man. <laughs> he he is does Gwild- his role he fine. Is like he's Gwildor meant to be levels. this. Gwildor levels. I say it again. No. Yes. And it's also amusing because Dolph was he man. He just makes me uncomfortable. I don't like him. That's, he's supposed to. That's the, the exact purpose. He's supposed I, to be that creeper guy. He always plays that guy. Always. I've never seen him do anything different. It makes me think that's what he's like in real life, and I don't like that. Okay, well, he's an actor. That very well might not be. It, it might be him in it real life. Be. But you ever think about that? Does it that might not, be. But you're creeped out. Calm down, man. So Kane questions him about the location of the drugs, and I don't know why he would know that. Um, I'm guessing at this point, because they don't know that it's an alien, that he thinks that the drugs might just be recirculating. Have you heard of anybody with a big score, making big deals, this, that, get to the guy with his ear on the ground? But Um, I find it weird, though, that his response is, it's with the Martians. It's like, that's a little too on the nose there, writers. Yeah. I agree. I don't think that fits at all, and it throws it off even more. But Kane somehow gets the inspiration from watching a pool pool game. And I hate that, too. Maybe the weapon that killed the uh, the white boys acted like a cue ball ricocheting after each hit. I don't know why he would think that. He has no reason to believe it would. But... They go back to the murder scene and they trace the trajectory of the object and find it embedded in a speaker. Um, I don't want to knock Dolph or the character too much, but I think this is too smart for him. Um, I'm okay with like a character like this having like a smart breakthrough, not necessarily making them a smart character, but I don't think that the pool... Just seeing him people playing pool is enough of a revelation aha moment that this character would get that. I agree. I think it would be better suited if it were Agent Smith that got that. Because he seems like that kind of character, being very observant. Um, And that automatically starts to level them out a bit more. So you've got the street smarts of Jack Kane and like his brawn. He's, He's a an intimidating figure, but then you've got the tiny um, agent Smith who's so by the books, but he's so by the books that he catches on to every little thing that would make sense for me. 
Yeah, well, none of that here. No, I, I, David Cap, man. I mean, you've wrote, you've written some great things and you've written some terrible things. This seems to be a weird mix, but this is not solely his work. So let's blame someone else. Uh, thoughts on what happens after the discovery of the disc? Um, for someone so by the book, Smith just trying to grab the disc without even putting gloves on even before he knows that it's going to cut him, is just stupid. Yes. yes. I'm like, glad you brought that evidence. up. It's the murder weapon. Don't yeah. pick it up with your bare hands. You deserve that cut. Yeah. And then, of course, being the genius that he is afterwards, like, oh, don't worry, man. I know what I'm doing. And then it flies around the room because you don't know what you're doing. Yeah, exactly. And it like just flies back into the speaker. Uh, we don't know why at this point. But th this scene this one block of the movie makes these characters unbelievable because it goes against everything we've seen them do up until this point i don't know if changing it would help the rest of the movie but it just i don't know maybe just get rid of it and have them discover the disc because we we don't need more of that stupid weapon in this movie no um talik kills a guy in a parking garage in the same way he killed the bondsman uh but i've I felt this one. I wanted to see more of this Houston guy. He seemed wicked. And I, also, I kind of want to hear more of the music he was listening to. I'll have to look that up later. <laughs> <laughs> um, Azik arrives. And uh, now we see he's there to kill Talik. But Talik escapes. So, what do you know? It's good alien versus bad alien. I hear your disdain. That was a decent sigh. Why is Dolph here? <laughs> Well, Azik doesn't exactly stand much of a chance. As well, we just make Dolph the alien bounty hunter. Then who's after him? That, that's just. Well, see, I, originally I'm okay with this because I like the idea of cop versus alien, like we see in Predator Two. But having another alien help out, you get that really awkward buddy cop scenario. Both of them fighting an alien and. Honestly, that sounds like it should be more of a comedy than like a science fiction action. But I, I, I think if the Azic was given more of a character, was more prominent on screen, but only, only when he's paired with Dolph, would that work? Sure. <laughs> that's, that's it. Yeah, like you've said it perfectly. Do anything other than what you're actually doing. Oh, that's. I mean. You're putting different words into my mouth there. No, just, that's exactly what you said. Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, we get some banter between Kane and Smith as they arrive at Kane's fucking amazing apartment. And movie apartments are the best, dude. Yeah. They're, they're <laughs> I don't know how he affords that. Thing. Especially with uh, the other guy being so much more successful and making twice as much as him. Yeah. And he's amazed at, at Kane's apartment. Uh, it's, I don't know, it's funny. It doesn't make sense. I also don't see Kane as a wine drinker. No. Like, I feel like you look at the character, you see the character do what he does, you listen to him speak, the man doesn't know how to open a bottle of wine. Yeah. That's the part where he's like, um, oh, did you misjudge me? And I think he's referring to the apartment or whatever. Yeah. But it really should just be the fact that he's drinking wine. It's like, yeah, I did misjudge you. I'm surprised you're not drinking, like, I don't know. Moonshine out of your bathtub. <laughs> Tub shine. <laughs> I, I also don't see him as the type to keep a framed photo of him and his ex on the coffee table. But I, I also don't know anybody who keeps framed photos of anybody on their coffee table. It just seems very strange to me. <clears throat> and Smith leaves. And I'm assuming Kane gets tipsy and then just goes to Diane's home. Well, he clearly goes to the university first, although we don't see that right now. Yeah. Diane's reaction is an insult to her character. It's not natural in the slightest. It, no. It, fuck, it made me uncomfortable. <laughs> she just slaps him in the face twice, and then they make out and spend the night together. Mm-hmm. Very realistic film relationship. I don't know who I'm more mad at, you or me for giving in to you. You're probably mad at yourself, woman. Uh, it, it, let's let's approach the situation differently. First of all, just don't let him in. He's an asshole. The next day, 
Kane returns home. Like I said, they don't right, say that he stayed there the night, but he's returning during the day. Finds the door ajar uh, and that his apartment's been trashed. Lewis is already there. And I say Lewis because I'm about to say Larry, Agent Smith. I like that they kind of set him up as the one who trashed his apartment. That is maybe one of the things that they did really well was they had me guessing quite a bit of the movie if Agent Smith was against Dolph. Yeah. It's the only thing that makes sense, though. Because that that is what happened. Like, Kane had already left the disc with a friend. And this is where he stopped by the university before he went to see Diane. The only other person that knew that Kane had that disc is Lewis. Uh, why is he Lewis again? Smith. So we have to believe that Smith has informed the FBI that they found a murder weapon. Kane has it and they trash his apartment looking for it. And they just get uh, Talek killing a mechanic at a garage. Yeah. They spent a lot of time on this mechanic. Yeah, they really did. I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm a okay with that, but uh, it's a throwaway scene. He's yep, just yep. collecting, and we cut to the lab through a pretty fun transition shot. But what is up with Doctor Bruce, Sandro? I thought maybe he had Tourette's. I don't know. This guy is jacked on something like he's I, slamming coffee with added caffeine i get that but this is like a cocaine bender like unlike anything i've ever seen before yeah i i didn't know what to make of his unique personality i didn't like him i still <laughs> don't he's also not somebody i would give the disc to no nah, he seems okay yeah of course for the sake of the script, he can take care of it uh, and gives us the reasoning of, or the explanation of how it works because the weapon is an electromagnet and you can set it at different frequencies. So even like the minor electromagnetic frequency of the human body, you can set it to that and it will just ricochet off of one to another. But I don't know why it doesn't stick in them and stay in them because they never really cover that. Yeah. Cause it's not like as soon as they die, they release the magnetic discharge immediately. Exactly. But I'm okay with it. I'm okay with it. It's yeah. not great, but at least they're trying to give it an explanation here. Exactly. They addressed it, and then we can <clears> move <throat> on. So we're at the morgue. Diane tells the boys that more bodies came in the previous night. And then we finally get the full explanation of what's happening. You covered it earlier. Massive heroin overdose, puncture to the head, neither are self-inflicted. Um, so Talek stole the heroin to inject people how did he know heroin that's my problem how did he know that this major will do have this impact on humans it opens or asks way too many questions and like, her getting i don't know if it's now or later in the movie uh when she's explaining to dolph how oh you know this is how you would have an ideal well, drug. And yeah, I say that, you know, ideally because yeah. we don't have the technology for this. Like, how did you piece any of it together to begin with? Yeah. Where is this coming from? But then it's also like, you have to ask the question, do these aliens, have they always known? Or how long have they known about Earth? How long have they been doing this? If this is a drug, that means it's been established that they've been injecting heroin <laughs> into humans and drawing the endorphins from their brain. But this has never come up in any police case ever. But when, when the other alien is explaining it to Dolph, he says, you can't let him get back. Yeah. Because if he does, more will come as if it's like the first attempt at this discovery. But they already know how everything works. It doesn't it, make sense. Exactly. Yeah. I'm I'm really starting to see your disdain for the uh, alien element of the Yeah, like the movie had such a good setup that if it was just humans that for whatever reason were experimenting on people by injecting them with heroin, like you could literally go to a different movie once that 
killing of Detective Ray happens and have a phenomenal just cops and robbers kind of movie here. Yeah. The alien element just opens up all of these plot holes. <laughs> it is entertaining, though. Yeah, they 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 present us with too many scenarios that they can't back up with explanations, and I, I'm just going to try and let that go. We had to do the same thing with Spaceballs. It's just you can't nitpick certain things. But I mean, yeah, these are two very different that. kinds of movies, though. You can't That's compare what that to Spaceballs. Yeah, you can't compare anything to Spaceballs. Fuck that. Uh, we get a bit of uh, humor here, at least in my eyes, when Manning sends Kane a photo with a taunting note written on it. Yeah, that's not bad. It was really funny. And then we get a decent car chase and shootout with the white boys. Um, the scope on Smith's gun is problematic for me because it's about the same size as his gun. Okay. That's it. Okay. High-rise infiltration scene can only happen in an action film. So you set off car alarms, sneak past the white boys, interrupt a business meeting, and hold Warren, who's the second in command, at gunpoint. Yeah. Do you see any problems here? Ah, uh, where do I begin? Well, I'll start you off with everybody in the fucking meeting has a gun. Yes. Every single one of them. Just shoot Jack. No. They could fucking get away with it. A crazy uh, they don't man burst into the meeting. And he was going to shoot the guy holding the meeting. He never stated who he was or what he was doing there. So we killed him in self-defense. Yeah, no, no, can't do that. That's so dumb. Yep. I do like that the uh, the white boys think the cops took the heroin, though. It makes sense, yeah, right? it does. See, this is, going back to the writing, you can tell multiple people worked on this script. Okay. Because there's some amazing lines of dialogue and there's some horrible dialogue there's some fantastic plot elements and some massive plot holes like it, it it's obvious not one person wrote this all the way through correct so the white boys capture lewis <sighs> fucking lewis smith i just started typing lewis in my notes why i don't know <laughs> Uh, and uh, they forced Kane to complete their next drug deal. Thoughts? Okay. Any thoughts on this one? The, the plan here to get him to do the drug deal or just the drug deal itself? Yeah, we'll go with the drug deal itself. I mean, we get Ali on. Yeah, we do. That's always good. Um, this actual scene makes no sense as well because if this... I don't even think we get a name. This Asian man that Ali Ong is portraying is apparently going to betray the white boys. Seems like a bad idea regardless of the situation. <laughs> yeah. Like, okay. Al, Al Leong is such a legend. Casting him as a luggage salesman, I find hilarious. Well, obviously the luggage salesperson thing is, is a, a cover. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I, you see, I like that twist though of him betraying the white boys and stealing the drugs, because it completely fucks over Kane. It's it's a fun twist you don't normally see. Unfortunately, though, we don't see much of Al after this. No, again, incredibly underutilized. He runs out of there with <laughs> such a bad plan too. Like I'm just gonna. Give him an empty briefcase and then reveal this gun. All right. <laughs> Didn't really think that one through. But then he runs out in the uh, alley and we cut back to him and he's dead. Yeah. After Dolph chases him a little bit to, to look for him. But Tell all right. To, thanks again. for coming out. Yeah. It, it does give us our first encounter between Talek and Kane, though, which I enjoy. Uh, it, I feel it could have been done much better. And then we get Azek showing up and chasing off Talek. Yeah, the more I talk about this, the more I'm with you. We we really don't need Azek in this at all. No. Uh, what did you think about uh, Smith's escape from the white boys? I mean, it's about time that he was able to show that he has some sort of capabilities that got him his job. Because up until now, he's just been a boob. Yeah, what what capabilities specifically? 
Because uh, Talek's gunfire causes cars to explode around them, and that's yeah. when the, the fight and scuffle ensues. Yeah, but then he does actually fight them a little bit before kicking the final guy in the balls, but... He picks a dude up and throws him. Yeah. This tiny man just lifts a larger man off the ground and tosses him away. Yeah, like I said, finally showed some capabilities. That's insane. Also, all of the white boys have guns, too. I didn't know how to actually use those. Yeah, just shoot them. They're mostly decorative. Okay. Cut to an abandoned area of the city, and it's revealed that Talik has the briefcase of heroin, which, I mean, we had to assume anyway. Um, didn't we see him grab it and run away when he, ki- like, broke in at the very beginning of the, into the drug deal? M- most likely, I just forgot. Okay. So another shot, or another scene of Kane and Diane, um, and this is where we get the explanation you were talking about, the whole nature's perfect drug thing. How does she know any of this? How any does she know, of it? How does she know that one ounce would be a thousand doses? Of this hypothetical made-up drug that you don't actually know anything about. Yeah. I, I I don't know. It's so confusingly terrible that I'm actually not flabbergasted by Kane's line to Smith of, I think we're dealing with aliens and not from Mexico. <laughs> like, that's a bad fucking line. But after the scene we just had, I will let this pass. Yeah. Uh, so they go to retrieve the disc, uh, but someone roughed up Dr. Bruce and took it. Yeah, they roughed him up good. Yeah. I like that we're still dealing with this mystery, though, because they haven't flat out said it's the FBI doing it. So toss in a bit more of a mystery an hour into the movie. I'm down for that. That's good well, writing. It helps because the doctor even says they kind of looked like you. And he points to Smith, right? Exactly. But so did the white boys. Well, exactly, but that's it's continuing this trend of making you think that perhaps there is something going on here with Smith. Yeah. Like, I knew <laughs> in the end it wasn't going to be the case, but no. it, it gives you this suspension of disbelief, so to speak, that, oh, m- maybe, maybe he is part of it. Yeah. It, it's good. It's very good. Unlike the next scene, um, which is the... the fight at the supermarket between Talek and Azek. Because as far as the gunfight goes, it's cool. The explosions look really good. But then Azek just gets shot in the chest. Yeah, he wasn't much of a hero. Didn't really help too much. Just no. kind of got killed. Also, Kane, in the next scene, trying to convince the captain that they're dealing with aliens probably is not the smartest move. Malone thinks that Kane's crazy and aloof anyway. If he goes in ranting about aliens, I mean, what do you think is going to happen? Exactly this. <laughs> yeah. So they get a call about the attack at the supermarket. They have a witness this time. And uh, we get an argument outside. Do you remember this argument? Um, No. Diane's there, and she's not allowed to see the bodies. But people are writing reports and signing her name to them. Yes, right, right, right. Yeah, Kane and and Smith try to throw their weight around, and they're shut down when the cop or whatever this person is blocking them calls in two of the weakest-looking guys to back him up. It is so unintimidating. Yeah, again, it's Dolph. Look at him. (laughs) Yeah, but they just walk away. At least we get Kane confronting Malone. Um, And Malone states there actually wasn't a witness, but everything has been handled and the case is closed. See, I thought there was a witness. They said there was a witness. I don't. Oh yeah, there. Yeah, there was a witness. No, the the security guy that's in there. Yeah. Right? Um, is it Talik? Is the villain? I can't yes. remember the stupid yeah. names. Uh, he goes to 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 do his process on him, but gets interrupted. That's right. So in my mind, I'm like, oh, did they shut this witness up now? Yeah, I mean. That's that's kind of what they're implying. This is a much more interesting story than the aliens. You're right. Really yeah, thought. the aliens drastically takes away from what could have been a phenomenal, like like I said, cops and robbers movie. Yeah, it it it's such a weird twist of character for Kane 
because he's so defeated, he's just accepting of it and tells Diane they have to go on vacation together. Yeah. So he's willing to drop everything that's happened. Tells her to go home and pack and pick him up. And of course she agrees, saying, mess with me on this one and I'll have your lungs filled with water. The fuck kind of statement is that? That's a very healthy relationship they got there. <laughs> um, I do enjoy the next scene. Okay. It's uh, Kane and Smith arguing, and then the car scene. So, like, they argue, split up. Kane gets in the car. Azix in the back for a little bit of a jump scare. Uh, I'm glad he knew which car to get into. Yeah. I like that Smith gets in the passenger seat as he's, like, trying to apologize. It's the first time he kind of seems like a real person in this movie. But um, Azik just tells them why Talik is there. Uh, and you said a warning that like, if he does go back to his home planet, then others will come in droves. Fine. It doesn't make any sense whatsoever. But then I think the main point of this is just to get Smith and, and Kane to patch up their partnership. It's, all, it's a lot in a very short time. But I think it reinvigorates the story and kind of throws us immediately into the third act. But Sandro, I have a question for you. Okay. Azik's death. <laughs> <laughs> he makes Kane promise to stop Talik. Yeah. But then explain explain how Azik dies. Um possession? <laughs> the demon he, was released out of him? I don't know. Fucking explodes. Yeah, it almost after it like something like a glow comes out of his mouth and, and eyes. Yeah, <laughs> you can't ask me to explain this. <laughs> well, no, it's just it's not it's not how he dies that I have a problem with. Okay, it's that he makes Cain promise to stop Talik, but then almost kills Cain by exploding when he dies. Like mention that's gonna happen. It's very like, convenient timing, too, because they're like, well, at least now we can prove that we have aliens because we have the body of this guy who just has white eye contacts. And then that's when the body goes into, you know, self-destruct. Yeah, and he's he's so, so adamant. He's like, promise me. Promising isn't going to do a thing if you explode and kill everyone in the car. I but, get that he's like a international policeman or whatever chasing after um inter international? Oh yeah, sorry, interplanetary. <laughs> um chasing after this uh Talic guy, but <laughs> why does he give a shit about the humans? I don't know. At least Smith gets Azix's gun here. So this is where we finally get the reveal that the FBI know of the aliens. Because Smith just gives the gun to Switzer, who is about to shoot Smith, but is in turn shot and killed by Kane. Mm -hmm. I have a major problem here. Okay. Do you? Uh, I mean, where do I begin? I, I, I want to hear. Okay, go for it. Tell, tell me your issue with this, and I'll let you know if we line up. Um, well, there's a lot of elements you could be referring to, so the likelihood of lining up is not very high. Mm-hmm. But there are so many issues with, first of all, why is Dolph following him? He says it's because I was following my gut or whatever he says, but he has no reason to believe that he's going to kill him, right? Agreed. Like, he does definitely say not to trust him. I, I don't know. There's a lot wrong with this. You tell me your side of it. Um, well, Kane just murdered an FBI agent. That's not going to fly. Smith quits the FBI on the spot, throwing his credentials on Switzer's corpse. So we have a murdered FBI agent that you can prove was killed with Kane's gun and Smith's ID is on the corpse. Man, I didn't even think about that element of it. <laughs> it's, it's so dumb. They just, there's no way. There's no way they're getting out of that. When all is said and done, they still murdered an FBI agent, and there is mountains of proof. 
So they track Talek down where we get the inevitable fight and escape after shooting him and stealing the endorphins that he stole from his victims. I, The more I think about this drug thing, the more I hate it. Okay. How does Kane even know what it is? Like, he finds that little, like, cooler fanny pack <laughs> and opens it, and he's like, oh, yeah, we've got it. Like, do you? Do you know what that is? Did Diane tell you this? She seems to know a lot. She knows everything, dude. Exactly. Speaking of which, I love how he already forgot about the vacation that Diane was packing for. <laughs> well, I mean, they, they definitely had some things come up. I know. But, like, they, they do it so well that I forgot about it, too. Like, this happened right before they found a dying alien in his car. Yeah, I'd say my mind would probably be elsewhere as well. Oh, man. This movie would be so much better if Talek was Alf. Uh, how would you work that? I guess he wouldn't be injecting people with heroin and extracting endorphins. He'd just be like hoarding cats. Take yeah. back to Melmac. Anyway, um, we get a pretty fucking cool shootout with our heroes, the white boys, the police, and Talek, all followed up with a pretty badass car chase. So I think you would agree that this is full on action movie territory now like we're ramping up to end this thing yep a uh, question for you okay how does talik know how to drive i don't know guy can't even say more than one sentence <laughs> but when his car is destroyed the way he runs after them is fucking horrifying <laughs> i actually had a nightmare about it like it, it was unnerving to me. Um, but yeah. Anyway, we get our final showdown at some old factory, and it's just classic, classic action shit. Um, I do have to ask what your thoughts were about when, when Kane shows Talik the uh, little jars of endorphins in his hand, and then drops his gun. What What are we doing? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. It's weird, right? Yeah. And and Talek looks completely confused as to what's going on and then drops his gun as well. I I I don't understand. Nope. So Talek a- attacks Kane with his weird Mortal Kombat Scorpion spike thingy. And this is you have to agree with me the worst acting we see from Dolph all movie him struggling for it, not to like pierce him. Yeah. And this goes on for what feels like minutes. The thing is completely limp. It's, it's it's absolutely terrible, but Kane stabs Talek with it, then impales him on a pipe and shoots him. Um, we get what could be one of the worst lines in the movie. I'm not going to say it, because uh, it might come up in awards. I don't know. And then our survivors just walk away from the scene, joking about Kane and Diane's vacation. So we freeze frame, roll credits, and the movie's over. The fuck yep. just happened? That's a very good question. What the fuck just happened? I don't know. It's a weird one, man. Yeah. I feel like I say that a lot, but this is definitely a weird one. Yep. So I know I, know I really spoke a lot in this episode breaking things down but every scene or so i'm just like i i i don't know if i'm gonna remember this some of this is so absolutely ridiculous i need to make note of it is there anything in the movie you wanted to point out that i may have missed that you feel is worth discussing no no okay i kind of figured i just want to give you the opportunity <laughs> um well i appreciate that that's nice of you very yeah, very cordial <laughs> Um, I guess we'll just go into money. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Now, before I ask what you think the budget is. Okay. Did you know that this is an independent film? No, I didn't know this was a movie until last week. It screams big budget, like major production company to me. I wouldn't have been surprised if this was a theatrical release, just, you know, big ish movie that I just didn't know about. 
it did it did get a theatrical release. It's just I, I expected it. I didn't pay any attention to the um, the production company credits at the beginning. But I would not be surprised if this was like a canon film, like the classic 80s and early 90s action blockbusters. But uh, knowing that, knowing that it's independent and funding had to come from multiple investors, how much do you think was spent on this movie? And there's not an exact number. It's a, a, a like X to X. One to two million? Oh, okay. Maybe I... I I put you off in the wrong direction. It's five, five to seven. Okay. But Dolph was already an established actor here. And I believe Ben Ben was as well. So Ben Ben, what a terrible name. Well, I mean, it's a surname. He didn't pick it. Take a terrible name and just duplicate it. Hey, no, <laughs> let's not go there. How much, mo- how much money do you think this movie made? <laughs> One to 2 million. <laughs> well, you'd be right in that it's less than the budget, but no. Uh, even this is completely, you know, undetermined. It's like 4.35 million to 4.37 million. I don't know why we're having a problem over that $20,000, but it did not even make its actual filming budget back, unfortunately. So, the ratings. IMDb, what do you got? Four point seven. Six one. Okay. And we'll just rush through the tomato meter. What do you think the critics gave it? What do you think the audience gave it? I'm gonna say fifty for both. Thirty six and forty six. Okay. I think that's more along your lines how you felt about this movie. Sure. But let's oh let's get into uh the awards. You got it, man. So what did you have for your worst or least favorite character? Not worst by any means. Least favorite is um, FBI agent Switzer. Okay. Played by David Aykroyd. Um, I honestly really enjoyed all of the actors minus uh, whoever played Azik in this. Um, we're supposed to hate Switzer and they do a good job of making us do that right down to the, like you've got to crack a few eggs to make an omelet line. Like he's just skeezy and it, it works well. Even fucking Pollard, the creepy little man in this fits the movie. (laughs) I don't know why you are so, okay, never mind. Fuck that guy. Is he dead? I'm going to find out. It's Michael J. Pollard. I probably has a huge following. I just pissed off a bunch of people. November 20th, 2019, aged 80 years old. Well, yes. Let's let that go. (laughs) R.I.P. Michael Pollard. Sorry for being an asshole. (laughs) Moving on. Your least favorite character? I had uh, Jim Haney as Captain Malone. Really? He lost me, like, right at the beginning when he has no idea if he's mad or not at Dolph. That whole first appearance... I'm so sorry to hear about that, but I don't know if I should throw you through this window. It's like, what are you doing? Mad was a very good term to use there. Not angry, but mad is in insane. Yeah. He's all like, over the place. I don't know what this character was supposed to be. Fair enough. I, I really liked him, but your explanation makes perfect sense. I will say his acting in those scenes was also, in my opinion, quite poor. Hmm. Because there was a level of overacting here that was just on another level. Yeah. All right. So, yeah. Favorite character? Uh, I mean, I went with Dolph. Yeah, yeah. It's got to be a bias, but I mean, I can't not love him in everything now. I this <laughs> <What>? podcast has <laughs> completely made me a gigantic fan. What was your turning point for Dolph? I don't know. Just, you were uh, always aware of his presence. Yeah, well, like I said, I mean, he was the villain in one of my favorite movies of all time, Rocky IV. Yeah. But I just didn't have the same exposure level to, uh, like, I'd say a bigger library of his movies. Okay. And just keep watching him do fantastic work in these movies is just awesome. I mean, we did cover Masters of the Universe, though. 
Yeah, and that didn't. That was not the turning point. Just if, if you're looking for <laughs> clarification. Yeah. No, he is pretty bad in that. But I mean, um, like Universal Soldier, Showdown in Little Tokyo. Yeah. Yeah, he's he's fantastic. I hope he keeps putting shit. Man's in his sixties. I think he's like sixty-five now, and I just want to see more Dolph movies. Yeah. I, also, Jack Kane. It has to be right. Hmm. Um. I I do have to say I almost picked Matthias Hughes as Talek because I found him incredibly imposing. I guarantee he couldn't see shit through those contact lenses. So the acting would be spot on. He's a stunt man. First and foremost, he's not an actor. Okay. So I think he was okay there. And I, I really do enjoy that character. I just think it, he's in it the doesn't wrong fit. Movie. Yeah. It doesn't fit in this movie in a specifically sci-fi movie. I think he would have been fucking phenomenal but this is a cop versus drug dealer movie it's not a cop versus alien movie even though it's trying really hard to be that so we'll go with the cop jack kane all right uh what did you have for your favorite or most memorable line i come in peace it's no <laughs> but uh, you didn't let me finish okay that is super memorable but it is that stupid fucking line at the end of the movie, which really taints this entire experience for me because it's when Talek has been impaled on that pipe and he says, I come in peace. And then Dolph just says, and you go in pieces asshole and shoots him with his own gun. And he explodes like that. That sums up. What's the proper way to describe this? The dumpster fire that this movie became. Sure. Sure started off very well and as it progressed you're like okay well they're throwing some mystery in to keep it grounded i like what they're doing here and then we just get ridiculous scene after ridiculous scene it feels completely disjointed and this this one line this one back and forth sums up that entire aspect of the movie in five seconds so yeah i think about dark angel or i come in peace and i think i come in peace and you go in pieces asshole you so there's a scene where they go back to the apartment and um jack gives uh smith a coat Mm -hmm. and he's like hey it fits perfectly and just in dolph's candid delivery straight fit like he does i love like i think his most humorous lines in his movies are when he just does the straight dry delivery of lines Mm -hmm. he's just like it should it was mine when i was 12 (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty good yeah Dolph is just so good at that yeah um, memorable scene or favorite scene um, I don't have anything written down I couldn't pick a favorite scene so I had to go straight up with memorable so there's got to be something that stands out even negatively for you if if you're gonna explain this movie to somebody, what would be the first thing you told them? Uh, Dolph delivers this amazing roundhouse kick in the beginning of the movie. There you go. That's all you need. <laughs> he really does. We've been over it. It's fantastic. <laughs> I guess that's my favorite scene. <laughs> yeah. Honestly, man, my most memorable scene is the one that I have a major problem with. Okay. And it's that it's the death of the white boys in the bar by the flying disc. Like as a kid, I thought that was awesome. Today, it's pretty fucking weak, man. I don't like it at all. But it stands out to me because it's so ridiculous, and you don't see anything like that really in other action films. When those robbers pulled up to uh, rob the store yeah. or whatever, you know that doll follows them in. Mm-hmm. I actually thought they're going to go in there, and there's going to be this like drug war shootout that would have been cool but no 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 we we have to have this alien element like this movie could have been so much better if they just didn't do the alien stuff yeah yeah i i can't argue that at all like it's or against it i mean i can definitely argue for it um i'm i'm glad I'm really glad we have this movie. It is entertaining. It is enjoyable. But there is a a much better movie that could have come out of the bits and pieces that are in the script. 
All right. So why don't why don't you get to your closing thoughts and or recommendations of this movie? Um, it's broken. It's a very broken movie. Uh, there, there's, I, I love it. I really do. But there's something missing that could have made it absolutely amazing. It's entertaining. Uh, it's something I watch like every couple of years and enjoy. It's not great though, and it should be. Uh, Dolph is amazing and everything. He's amazing in this. If you're a fan of Dolph Lundgren, definitely watch it. Is it a recommend though? I don't think so. It, it's lacking serious cohesion in its storytelling. So unless you grew up with this movie, I don't really think you need to see it. And I feel sad saying that because we, we love Dolph so much. We want to recommend his movies, but I think he's the strongest part of this. And then there's really nothing close to him. So um, no, no, I don't recommend it. And I hate saying that. I'm glad I bought it, but if we were just to talk sci-fi movies with a stranger, uh, the first thing I would say is not, have you seen I Come in Peace? It's just, it's not going to be there. So no. What what about you? Would you recommend this? No, not a chance in hell. Oh, fuck. I'm shocked. This movie is absolutely terrible. Um, I'm disappointed you picked it because I did not want to know that this is in Dolph's repertoire. I think the biggest crime that this movie commits is having such a strong start that displays such capability and then 180ing the movie into something completely different. Because legitimately, and this did not like hyperbole or whatever, if the movie just kept going with the white boys and a drug war with Al Leong's crew or something like that and Dolph is stuck in the middle of it, I think we could have had an amazing movie, but there, I don't know if it was just the time that this came out and they had to like shoehorn in this sci-fi element. I don't know what, like, is it supposed to like compete with Predator? I don't like, it's just diminishes it. And by creating that um, contradiction, it gives the impression that the movie we actually have is even worse than it is because it looks like the writing is capable, the cast is capable, and they just they just blow it partway through. Like, the second time I watched this movie for the review, I got to about 30 minutes in. I was at the scene where Dolph was planning to go to see Diane. And at that point, my brain was just like, I don't want to watch the rest of this. Yeah. I had no problem with the first 30 minutes because... It feels like you start with that heist scene and you're like, this is going to be a flat out awesome. And maybe it would have been a little more cookie cutter in that situation. But I think that in that case, that would have been the smarter way to go. Well, I'll let you know right now that was the part that was shoehorned in. This evolved from a script that dealt mainly with aliens in the first place. And uh, they had to adjust it. So they added in the, uh, the drug dealing elements. Well, in that so, case, the... In- well, no, give me one second here, sure. because I think had you gone into this knowing the alien element, you wouldn't have been so gung-ho about this being like a heist drug gang versus cop movie, because this that's just supposed to be your introduction, and you were hoping that that was going to be the movie when you were not given any reason to expect that that's what the movie's going to be. I get that you really like that. I do too. And I would like to see that be its own thing. But I don't know if you can really shit on a movie that hard because it does take a turn. I mean, even after you telling me that, I feel like they should have then just fully embraced and gone 100% into the alien uh, part of it. Mm -hmm. I think that that whole divide of not really being sure if you want to be a cops versus robbers or alien movie is the problem. Maybe, maybe it's because the first thing you get is the cops and robbers part that made me think that that would be the better movie. But it's possible that if you just did a full out alien thing, then it could have been a good movie there too. But okay. That's exactly what I was hoping you were going to say. Cause it, I agree with you 100%. The fragmentation of this story fucks the rest of it. Yeah. Um, 
So no, I, I don't recommend it. <laughs> and I actually, unlike you who said, if you're a Dolph fan, definitely watch it. I'd say don't because it might put a little bit of a sully on him for you. Did it did it sully Dolph for you though? Because you seem to love him in this movie. He's just in a movie that you hate. Yeah, I still wish he wasn't in it. <laughs> <laughs> you could have done better, Dolph. You should have made the decision to pass on this script, man. Wait, wait. You think this is worse than Masters of the Universe? You think, I think I'd rather watch Masters of the Universe again. You are fucking crazy. That I'm not saying it's awful. the better. I'm not saying it's the better movie, but Masters of the Universe is so bad and doesn't suffer from the same identity crisis that at least I could watch it again and rip it apart. In this one, I'm just like, I can't commit to it, love or hate. Wow, you really didn't like this. No, I didn't. And wow. I'm it's sorry, sad man. because like '90s action movies were my jam, and yeah, I think you know that. I, that's why I picked it. I thought you would love this. 80s, 90s action movies was literally what I grew up on, and this movie yeah. might be one of the worst. Fuck. That's harsh. Anyway, those are our thoughts on Dark Angel, a.k.a. I Come in Peace. If you want to share your thoughts with us, you can hit us up on social media. We are on Twitter at BS Bargain Bin, Facebook.com slash BS Bargain Bin, BS Bargain where you can also find links to our merch. And, of course, the comments section in YouTube, which is perhaps our most utilized. Ben. Yeah. I'm ready to move on from this episode. So let me know what am I hitting play on for next week. Okay. Well, we were we were speaking earlier this morning about how we've been covering a lot of action movies lately. And we kind of should go, go back to what we were doing before and covering a lot of horror. So we're definitely doing that. And what is my favorite monster? The werewolf? Correct. Do you know how long it's been since we've covered a werewolf movie? Dog soldiers? Yeah. Do you know when that was? I'd say in the 40s, maybe? No. It was 36 episodes ago. Oof. Nine months. It's been nine months since we talked werewolves. Okay. And... To any horror fan, I think we would all agree that 1981 was the best year for werewolf films. And we already talked about one of the two big ones that came out that year. The Howling, you know, the movie that you love so much. Um, So we're going to talk about the other 1981 werewolf movie, An American Werewolf in London. Isn't this fun? Lovely stroll on the moors. Did you hear that? I heard that. What is it? You think it's a dog? Nice doggy. Good boy. What happened to them? Well, the police report said they were attacked by an escaped lunatic. A wolf. My friend Jack was just here. Ah! Told me that I will become a monster in two days. Your dead friend, Jack. Yes. You gotta believe me, David. Believe what? You're one of the undead, and I'm a werewolf. Tomorrow night's the full moon. You're gonna change. A what? You'll become. I know. I know. A monster. A naked American man stole my balloon. What? What did I do last night? You don't remember? The last remaining werewolf must be destroyed. It's you, David. Run! Good Lord. Until next week, have a good one. All the best.